Welcome to another episode of Corporate CPR, where we breathe life back into your organization projects and processes, giving you insights to recovery and avoiding corporate mortality events. Today, we'll be talking about how to have staying power, and joining us to contribute to the conversation is Stephen Gaffney. Welcome, Stephen. Thank you for having me on the show. Yeah. Can you share with the audience about your background? So I started, gosh, almost three decades ago, and I started in the business by teaching people how to be honest in the workplace, but not from an ethical point, but really how to have difficult conversations. And what I found out is the biggest problem isn't what people say. It's actually what they don't say to each other. It's what they leave out. And so if you can get that unsaid said, that would be really helpful for organizations. And that's how we started. And that's really even the basis of the work we do today with teams. And how do you get that unsaid said? Yeah, fascinating. Well, today we're going to talk about, you know, kind of that perseverance and how do you how do you keep going even in tough times? And um, and you've you've related this concept back to power. Do you want to share a little bit about your thoughts there? Absolutely. So the new book is called Unconditional Power, and it'll be out September 12th. And if people want an article about it, just email us and we'll send them an article about um, some concepts they could use immediately. But here's the point that the, I wrote the book because I found out that many people think of themselves as powerful and, and ability and they're able to persevere, but they're really conditionally powerful. Conditionally powerful is where somebody says, well, I can get that done as long as I have more resources, as long as uh, more money, or as long as retention improves. There's always a condition or an excuse or a caveat. But unconditionally powerful is where we're powerful despite the conditions. In other words, we acknowledge there's conditions, but we're focused 100% on what we're going to do about it. And how do you do that? And the book is also how to inspire others to be unconditionally powerful. Hence the title, Unconditionally Powerful. Mm. And so what are some of the things that I guess put people in that position? Is it a mindset? Is it like, how, how are they conditionally powerful? Well, one of the strategies to get them out of it, which deals with why they're in it, is they're just not aware of it. So many people live their life. I mean, just think about relationships. Those people complain about a relationship and say, well, that person um, doesn't make me happy or they've ruined my day or they're very difficult to deal with. I'm not saying those aren't uh, possibilities. I'm saying it loses the focus of being 100% responsible for what we're going to do about it. So one of the strategies to get people out of this is to make them aware of it. Because I've taught this at Amazon, I've taught this at Marriott, I've taught this at all the major, a lot of the major organizations. And what I have found out is if you make the unaware aware, in other words, if we become aware of it, then we're like, oh my gosh, there's a whole nother dimension. We don't even realize how we live our day in what a client of mine has now deemed called conditionalism. We, it's all conditional right? I can get that done as long as they do this or as long as this happens. Instead of saying, well, wait a minute, they are the way they are. What am I going to do about it? So I'll give you an easy example. Just to, let's say you can't get somebody on the phone. You can say, well, you know, I could, get, I, I could really help them if, I would get on, if they'd get on the phone with me right. or they do a Zoom call or whatever or have a meeting. Well, okay, we can live our life that way, but a much better way would be, well, what can I do so that they would want to be on the call with me? Mm. So what am I going to do? So I worked with some of the best admirals, generals, and CEOs ever. And what I have found out is whenever they're faced with a problem, they focus on themselves first. They blame or focus on themselves first, where people who don't move tend to blame others first. And the problem with blaming is we give up our control. So back to the point of how we get there, I just believe because people are just unaware of it. And that's why I became so passionate around writing this book, because I realized, I mean, even as we're saying it, people are going to pick this up, how people live in a conditionalism world. They're just being conditional, but it's about being unconditionally powerful and making them aware and making ourselves aware. What, um, what, so I, when I've heard it said, then I guess I'd be curious on your um, perspective on this is that, you know, um, having that mentality of that everything is, is my fault and not in a um, yeah. negative, like, you, you know, it's an, an accountability way. So you can no longer kind of the same thing on what you're saying is no longer br blame your results on anything um, that everything, you know, that you control all the outcomes. 
Um, it, have you heard that? And, and is well, that in line with what you're saying? Yeah, it's a slippery slope, right? Because if we blame ourselves, then are we the victim and, you know, and, and victim mentality. But then it's also a slippery slope because things have happened. You know, I don't believe like, you know, we are the cause of everything in our life. We right. Things happen. And because otherwise that's a very slippery slope when bad stuff has happened to us. But we are 100 percent responsible on how we react to it and right. what we're going to do about that. So, I, you know, I say blame ourselves first, but maybe people have a lot of charge around blaming. Here's another way. Just take responsibility for ourselves, and we're 100% responsible. So the, if you think about it, the only thing you can ever control in life, there's only one thing, and mm -hmm. that's ourself. You yeah. can't control anything else, right. but we can control ourselves. But the interesting thing is when we focus on ourselves, we can do something. It's like playing tennis. You know, I'm not a big tennis player, but if somebody hits a shot, to you and then you or let's say you hit it to somebody's forehand and then they hit it to back to us and it's an ace i don't know about you but i know next time to not hit it to their forehand right you'd mm. want to get it somewhere else and so what happens is a lot of times by us behaving differently they will be differently here's an easy example in everyday life somebody is very tough to deal with what about finding something good about them and appreciating them because what i have found is a lot of people who complain don't feel appreciated so if you appreciate them in a legitimate way, right, in something that's very sincere, so they might start to smile and then they might say something nice or at least soften their tone. So and some people might say, well, I like that or not like it. But here's my point. If you focus on what am I going to do differently and do something different, it can make a huge change in an organization. And that's interesting why some leaders get into an organization and they suddenly the whole productivity changes. Sometimes for the better, for them, sometimes for the worse, but because they are doing things differently, which trigger other people to do things differently. Mm -hmm. I can give you an easy example of this right now, what's happening in the work world. So right now, it's very hard to employ. I mean, you know, it's, unemployment is very low, which means retention and recruitment are big issues. Well, here's the problem that becomes a slippery slope. For a lot of companies, they become hesitant to hold people accountable because they're worried if they're too tough on people, they're going to leave. But here's the irony. High achievers like to work with other high achievers. And if we don't hold people accountable, we're going to lose the great people. In fact, a client of mine said this years ago, her fear is the rise of the mediocre, mm. the rise of the mediocre. In other words, the people who can leave will leave. Right. And so anyway, my point is, that it's a lot around this, what we're talking about and how we view things and saying, what am I going to do about it? So if I soften my tone, which could be okay, but if I don't hold people accountable, I'm going to lose the great people. And then I got a really big problem. Hmm. Oh, absolutely. Um, let, let's talk a little bit then about that kind of more about that perseverance and, um, you know, I guess one of the things that comes to mind, so I'm a person who, um, you know, I, I tend to have pretty good perseverance, but then, you know, I get to the point where like, it's like, ah, oh, just never going to make, you know, make this happen. So what are your thoughts around um, knowing when to quit and when to keep pushing? It's an excellent question. And the, the answer is we make that call. But mm -hmm. here's the thing that we should not ever say. I've tried everything. Mm -hmm. So- We've all said that at times, but it really doesn't hold true. And I'll explain why. There's about 8 billion people who live on this planet, 8 billion mm. people. And if I were to say, oh, I've discovered a problem that nobody could solve. Think how arrogant and egotistical. You know what? I found a problem that I have encountered and nobody could solve. That's just ridiculous. Odds are somebody out there has figured out a solution to a potential problem that we're encountering. So whatever the issue is with our company or in our life, you can Google it. Now, chat GPT it, right? There's all right. kinds of resources mm -hmm. and it's like there are answers out there. So when do you say stop or I give up? Mm -hmm. The answer is that's a personal choice. You might say, I choose to not give this any more time. Right. I'm done. That's fine. That's a legitimate point, but just not coming from I've tried everything. Because when you say I've tried everything, you've really closed off that loop. But it is fair to say, I'm not willing to give this any more time or energy in a personal way, in a business way. And that's a fair judgment. We make that call. Mm. That's the only thing. 
No, that's fair enough. Um, but I guess, you know, when you're making that personal call, what are some things that I suppose should be factored into that um, analysis that you're doing? Um, because, you know, if, for instance, if I flash back to where, you know, this company was, um, you know, five years ago, um, you know, for instance, we were doing say email, email, we were trying to, we were attempting to use the email marketing, right. Where you write, you know, um, I, I can't even remember what, what it's called, but it's the targeted emails where they're customized to that company trying to talk about, Hey, um, here's your pain point and can, can, you know, and we can help you with your pain point and get you these results. Right. And it wasn't working, but it works for so many companies, you know, and you talk about that. And so it's like, well, do we keep investing in this um, and trying to make this work because we think we need to keep tweaking it? Um, or do we quit putting our dollars there and go put them somewhere else that might get us better results? Um, and there's a lot of unknowns there, right? Like right. it's really hard to go um, pull research to say, like, what's the root issue here? Well, a couple of things I could say on that. First is really drawing the lessons from these experiences, right? Mm. People, you know, that definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting right. different results. But yeah. so, yeah, we're going to send out another email, another email. No, I don't, I don't subscribe to that. What are mm. we learning from this? We might be learning where our messaging is off. We might be learning that it worked great for that company in that market, but it's not going to work in our market, or maybe it would, but what are we willing to do differently? So I think really an important part in all overall in life is the willingness to draw the gold from all of our experiences. I don't subscribe that all great things are benefit, or all bad things are beneficial. I'm a cancer survivor, and you know I've, I'm healthy and fine. But you know, somebody says, "Are you glad you went through cancer?" I'm like, "Are you crazy?" No, I'm not glad. But given that I went through cancer, I got a lot of gold from that experience. So you, you got to draw the lessons, whether it's in business or personal. So that's one aspect. The other aspect is to look at how we're framing, looking at this. So I would say in the email issue, um, one way to kind of take a step back is say, what are we ultimately trying to accomplish? Okay, we're, we're very wedded or have been wedded to a particular venue or a vehicle. Mm -hmm. But perhaps, what are we trying to do here? Well, we're trying to increase sales or we're trying to increase our profitability. So if we enlarge the frame, so if we take a problem and we look at it in a bigger way, then it creates other possibilities. And I see this a lot with discussions. People are, the frame of the conversation, the frame of the issue is too small. So they're battling it out instead of looking at the bigger frame. Like for example, it's one thing to say, I, we should do it one way or another way. But if we said, what's best for the company, what's best for the organization, it changes the way we view it. So I would say in that situation, not only lessons learned, but also what's the end game we're trying to achieve? And maybe there's a better way to achieve that, but let's not lose sight of the end game. And interesting enough, often people forget the end game. It's like, what's the North Star that's driving us to success? Yeah. Yeah. Um... Well, and I, and that's one of the things we say, we, you know, that's one of our values is we always stay focused on the end game because I think that perspective changes everything, right? Um, Absolutely. When things are difficult. Um, and, and when we say this, we're kind of more focused on projects, right? So you get into projects and they're just, some of them, you feel like it's, you're literally going to battle every day. Um and, and I find that mentality of staying focused on the end game really helps you realize like, hey, this is j just a day. This is not the rest yeah. of my life. And how are we going to make it through this? Um, and, and so that that kind of mentality is really important to staying um, uh, motivated, I guess. Absolutely. And there are also ways to look at it. So we developed a process. I developed a process years ago called a two hour and 18 minute strategy. In other words, it can take any issue and it can convert it into an actionable plan in two hours and 18 minutes. It's a timed approach. 
the governments use it, many corporations use it. It's, I mean, people are interested, we talk about that more. But, um, but the point is that it's a way to kind of look at a project or issue differently, because you're right, people get very wedded. So very mm. um, to the way it's got to be. So right now, there's a client of mine that had a, a major issue around, um, I'm trying to, I want to keep it confidential. So uh, it, it was around how they look at um, their office and everything else. And so they've been plagued with this. Well, they did the two hour and 18 minutes and it's not that they solved the problem, but they made significant progress to moving out because it's a forcing function to take action. Because what happens is uh, people spend way too much time talking and discussing and not taking action. And the thing is we learn by taking action. So sometimes with a group, whether it's a two hour and 18 minute strategy, a project or whatever, it's let's get things moving and do something different. And then that will open up other opportunities and moving out accordingly. So I see a lot of what you're talking about and it can be very frustrating. So the thing is we got to do something different. So here's another strategy out of unconditional power called um, intentional disruption. So here's an easy thing Mm -hmm. people can do. You're in a project, you're in a discussion and it's very frustrating, right? Nothing's moving forward. I'll give you three great questions that will automatically break up the conversation. The first one is, what would you suggest, right? So people go, I think we should do this, this, and this, and this. Well, um, I, I have this issue, and three years ago, we did this, and we tried this. Okay, what would you suggest? Well, we have tried this. No, what would you suggest? What's a way to move it forward? Mm. That's one. Another great question is, what would it take to get agreement here? People often focus on their position. Okay, well, how do we refocus and uh, what would it take to get agreement? And a really third great question, and I see this value uh, valuable in a lot of situations, is saying, can you live with it? I mean, how many of us, myself included, have wasted stupid time in discussions where we got attached to our ego and it was mm-hmm. really not big a deal, not that big a deal. I was doing a session for the Marines and and uh, and uh, this one participant was held out in, on this um, issue and she was asked these questions. And when it came, can you live with it? She said, you know what? I can. And I asked her later, what was the value? She said, you know, it made me think I can see I don't agree with this, mm-hmm. but it's not a deal breaker. And I'm mm-hmm. holding up everybody. But it took somebody to ask me that question to say, can you live with it? We got to move it forward. So yeah. the point being is we got to just intentionally disrupt it and go in a different direction. Mm. One of the things that I've, um, you know, hear a lot about, uh, you know, with, you know, you got agile, right, methodology from, you know, in the technology world. And then um, Tom by by Liu um, talks about, you know, his part of his decision making framework is that you you test and move on. And then I'm thinking about like Jim Collins. Good. You know, he talks about shoot bullet holes and then cannonballs. So just really this idea of iterating, um, trying something, but not investing in it too much when you're, when you're in the, you know, dealing with challenges or trying to persevere, you try it, you test it, you evaluate it and you move on. I mean, is that something that you see high performing teams do? How, how important is that iterate iterative process in, in this? I think it's critical. In fact, speed motivates. So mm. if you think about it, we've all been on teams where it just, it's like if somebody would said, you know, it's like the plane is circling the airport, but no one wants to land the plane, move it, right? Um, and so when it's slow, it actually demotivates. But interesting enough, if we take action, sometimes even the wrong action, but we're moving forward a sense of action, people get inspired, they get energetic. Mm. One of the things out of the 218 strategy that we developed, um, a, a lot of the side benefits was just motivating people, got excited. But the point being is that it's really critical to take action and not have a meeting where it wraps up this way. Well, we've had a lot of discussion and now we, uh, we, we agree to disagree. First of all, that line is ridiculous. I agree to, di- we've agreed to disagree. So what have we accomplished? We didn't accomplish anything. We're kind of back where we were, except now we have agreement that we have a disagreement. No, what's much better is to say, well, here we have disagreement, but we've taken at least one action that we could test out. One thing we could do, three things we could do. So one way to do this is to say, what's one action we could take between now and the next meeting that will move this forward? So I'm all about speed because speed motivates. And the other interesting thing about speed that people forget is speed improves quality. It actually improves quality. Think about it this way. Um, 
if one company gets something out the door faster than the other, they're going to get feedback. It may be mm. the case, hey, you missed the market, but they're already learning and moving forward. Another company, and we've seen this a lot, where companies take too long to get something out the door. So you could make an argument, and not always the case, but often speed improves quality. And so what I found by working with a lot of high achieving teams and great leaders and, and what we've helped out with is about moving forward because speed motivates people and it actually improves quality and it actually so therefore include uh, improves revenue and profitability mm. yeah you know i i think that's something that um maybe even people are coming to realize right this whole idea that you have to have this thick business plan but even before you start or these you know um we we try to do so much planning without actually any action and and we talk about in our company having a bias for action, because yeah. I think like you're talking about, if you if you step forward and you test, like it's not an excuse to be lazy or not think through things, but you don't want to get into this situation where you're doing all sorts of thinking without any moving, because, you know, you said it perfectly, like even if you've you stepped in the wrong direction, you got feedback. And so now you can. Um, you can adjust course at, versus the person who plans never has <laughs> the feedback. Absolutely. You know, another, it brings up another interesting point out of what you're talking about and what we're talking about is that another, there's many things I've noticed by working with the best CEOs, admirals, generals, and whatnot is the best ones are impatient. The worst ones are patient. Now, nothing in an extreme is good, right? Being overly impatient is not. But if you had to err on patience or impatience, impatience really helps because it pushes people, it speeds people up. And so I've seen way too many times where people will make arguments as to why something needs to be slower rather than how to make it faster. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, there was a, uh, there's a client of mine that um, there was a, um, something they were trying to move along and it was going through all the bureaucracy and people said, it's going to take 200 days to get it done. Mm. He said, that's absolutely ridiculous. He was the president of the company. He made one call and it was done within two days. Now, what's the difference? It was legal and ethical. All of that achieved. It's just people's got the sense of urgency because the president of the company said something. Now, we don't always need to get the president or an executive involved, but it does bring up the point that people can get stuff done a lot faster if they really want to. So how mm. do we move things along? So if you had to err on being impatient or patient, I would say a key successful trait is to err on being impatient because we'll push people and we push ourselves. A lot can get done. And to your point about a plan, you know, where people make these long term plans, that's fine. And in some ways, that makes sense for some industries. But there's just too many changes. Look what Chat GPT has done in the past six months. It's gone a whole bunch of people thinking and operating differently in business and in marketing and so many different aspects. So what's next on the horizon? So we can build kind of sketches, but we really have to build in a tremendous amount of flexibility and dealing with uncertainty. What is your, so one of the things we deal with a lot and be curious, it goes back to, so us as a, as a leader, if you have somebody who's, who's doing this, um, how do you, how do you get around it? And how do you really, I guess, I, I mean, even test what they're saying. So an example that we have is, um, you know, uh, uh, on a project that for a client, you know, they're saying, oh, we can't move forward yet. We need to do more testing. We need to do more testing. And like, it's amazing how much testing magically gets created that needs to be done that wasn't identified um, before. Um and sometimes, you know, it's hard to say, well, no, you don't need to do more testing, right? Because who are we, in, in some ways, who are we to judge? Like pushing back is one thing, but who are we to say, um, no, you, you've, you know, you should be comfortable with this and go ahead and take the, you know, whatever risk you think um, versus maybe it's just an excuse, right? Really this afraid to move forward for some reason. Um, um, yeah. What are your thoughts around that as a leader? How do you um, drive, drive that? I think the key is to ask why. Mm. To your point, it is, you know, maybe there is more testing, but quite often what I've seen when that is happening is people are really afraid to take action. They know they want to move forward, but they're really worried because um, if they take this risk, it could hurt their job, hurt their mm -hmm. position, uh, lose money or whatever. And so I don't, and I, you know, when I, I don't think, I don't subscribe to feel the fear and do it anyway. 
I subscribe to feel the fear and address the fear and resolve the fear. So fear is a, um, if that's what's going on, right? So if somebody's fearful, it's an important thing to address. It's like, I've coached many people through our nine step process around honest communication and, you know, to resolve issues. And one of the keys though, is to look at why somebody's hesitant to having the conversation and they're fearful. Well, I don't just say, well, you know, just don't worry about it. No, it's probably unlikely to happen. No, they're afraid. So what are we afraid? So I'm afraid if I speak up to my boss, then I'm going to get fired. So then I would say, okay, well, let's, let's look at what would you do if that happened? It's unlikely to happen using the process, but, and I've never seen it happen, but it doesn't matter. The point is, how would you address that? So I think in the testing case, it's to ask what's going on What's the fear? And sometimes what's really going on is, uh, is there is a fear and sometimes it's a false fear. Let me give you an example. Mm. One of the big things I see with organizations is the amount of organizational folklore. In other words, <laughs> things that people say is not mm. really reality, but we take yeah. it. Right? So for example, I say, well, we need to do this. And somebody might say, well, we tried that before and it didn't work. Oh, well, mm. I don't want that to happen. Instead, we should say, well, what happened? So what really went on? I'll share with you a funny story. I was doing a session uh, um, I, I was in Hawaii, not that it matters much, but it was, you know, have you been to Hawaii? It's awesome. But um, only, I've only been there a few times. But anyway, so uh, I was doing a session. We we're talking about um, honest communication. And somebody said, well, if you speak up in our company, you get fired. And I'm like, well, let's, let's hear more about it. I said, well, what actually happened? He said, well, I don't know. I said, well, why don't you know? And he said, well, um, uh, I wasn't there in the company when apparently this person was fired. Mm. It happened before my time. So think about this. This person is operating under, you can't speak your mind because the fear or the reputation of getting fired. But here's the interesting part to the story. There were people in his company and didn't want this issue to, to just go unaddressed. So they said, well, where, where did you hear it happen? So they traced it back to an individual who did lose their job. But when it was all said and done, they lost their job because they weren't achieving, they weren't producing the results. And so the reason why I say this is, uh, this happens a lot with government and major corporations is people cite policies and procedures that people don't really look at. And we don't look at together, we just take for granted. When was the last, where does it say we can't do it? Well, and And one way to politely press on people when you're addressing organizational folklore is to ask them, say, look, I'd like to learn from this. So if you're saying I can't do this or this happened, can you share with me more what actually happened where it says that? And so we learn a lot. In fact, I had a client of mine who changed the entire culture of a 9,000 employee organization because he created ideas. And every time somebody said it can't be done, he said, well, teach me, show me where it said it. And it didn't say that at all. And so that's what we can do. So addressing organizational folklore, and sometimes that's what's stopping people because they are under a reputation or experiences, but they never were there, or if they were there, they drew the wrong conclusions or they, it wasn't really what was going on. So we've got to ask them, why are they afraid or, or why more testing or why anything, right? The question of why is really important. And a lot of people have talked about that, but I find that very valuable to ask them why. And one other thing about why, Sometimes it feels uncomfortable. Why, 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 why? So you can say variations. Tell me more about that. Or Mm. what I find really interesting is tell the why behind the why. So it's one thing to say, why do you feel that way? Versus why do you feel that way? And the reason why I'm asking is blah, 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 blah. So the why behind the why. Anyway, I'm very passionate. You know, I I don't know. Have you have you come across uh, Chris Voss's literature? I've heard of him, but I'm Mm. not familiar with his work. Yeah, so he he's a you know FBI negotiator. Or he was in his past life, and now he has a negotiation company. But one of the things that um, he talks about is um, that I think you'd relate to is he he says it seems like you have a reason for saying that. And so when people, whatever they say, positive, negative, whatever, it seems like you have a reason for saying that because same type of thing you're talking about. It just draws out more without really putting any qualifiers on it. You know, it's not, it's not going to raise defenses. You're not saying, well, why do you think that? Or, you know, Um, and, you know, and his point is that if you say, you know, in in a negotiation, if you say that, then it's people tend to reveal more, but it, it, you know, it works in any part of life. You know, I think it's a kind of a universal tool when you want to draw, you know, more information out of people. 
Absolutely. And that's why I say the why behind the why, because my experience is when I encourage people to do that strategy or variations of that strategy, some people feel like, well, you know, I'm putting the person on the spot and I, you know, I, I, how are they going to feel about that? And I'll say, well, mm -hmm. why are you want to ask the why? And they'll say, mm -hmm. well, because I want to know whether we should test more or whatever, you know, using your example earlier. Well, explain all that. And it goes back to my very first point. The biggest problem in life is not what people say, it's what they don't say to each other. Mm -hmm. And if we get that unsaid said, it can really um, address things. So I don't believe in manipulative strategies. You just share, this is the reason why I'm asking this question. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to put you on the spot. I'm trying to learn more or address right. more. So right. getting that unsaid said is critical to making all this work. Well, isn't that the, uh, the tension point in romantic comedies? everything's yeah. going wrong because people just <laughs> won't tell each other what they really think. <laughs> it's interesting because I, you know, I'm hired for business, but I've had so many people use these strategies that save their marriage or change their child situation and change all kinds of really neat personal stuff because they realize, you know, it is a, a problem in life. We hold back. We don't get that unsaid said. And I'll show you a kind of funny story because sometimes somebody will push on me and say, well, if you can speak your mind, sometimes you can get in trouble. And so I had this lady in a session of mine. She goes, well, I told my coworker that he's dropping the ball and um, he didn't react well. And I said, well, why did you say that? She said, well, I mean, I said it because I do care about him and I, I'm trying to get us overall to achieve the mission and the goals and whatnot. She went on to explain the why behind why she had said that. I said, well, did you say all of that? And of course mm -hmm. she said, no. I said, you know, I, I would contend the big problem in life is it's not what we say, it's we don't say the rest of it, you know, even think, think about constructive criticism. The reason why sometimes people get so defensive is because we never say anything nice. Have you ever met mm -hmm. somebody that says, look, I'm just giving the honest feedback. But the problem is the only thing that ever comes out of their mouth is something wrong or negative or whatever. After a while, mm -hmm. we just say, forget it. Even if what they're saying is spot on, we get all turned off by that. So it is even getting the unsaid said and saying our appreciations. People are stingy about sharing appreciations. And they're saying, well, if I say one good thing, I don't want them to build a big ego. Well, how about do something different, right? So again, it goes back to getting that unsaid said. Mm. Um, and I guess, what are the principles behind that? I mean, I, I know you as an individual who have control over yourself. Do you have influence over other people to say what's not been said or... We could do a whole podcast on this, but I want to give some people immediate strategies. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of strategies I teach about how to get the unsaid said. So here's a couple really critical, important. Let me give you three right off the top of my head. First, ask questions. You know, it's interesting. A lot of people don't get the unsaid said because they don't ask questions. Well, again, we can ask it in an accusatory way, which is not good. But we can ask it, can you tell me more? Can you give me more feedback? Or what's the reason behind why, you know, all that stuff. We can, we can ask, but we got to ask these questions. So, so often we are upset with somebody else and I'll say, well, did you ask that? Or I'll say, I'm coaching somebody. I'll say, well, did you ask that person that? So even when I'm working with high achieving teams and these ex executives, it's getting that unsaid said, but a lot of it is by questions I'll ask and encourage them to ask questions. That's one thing. Another um, technique is, to create emotional safety. Now, this is really important because most of what's out there is psychological safety, but on purpose, I'm not using that term. I'm using emotional safety because my experience is that people hold back, not be, they can psychologically get it's okay to speak up, but that doesn't open people up. They need to feel safe. It's kind of, it's a feeling. So an example of not feeling is, have you ever had somebody say, look, you can tell me anything. I, I'd love honest feedback. And so you give them honest feedback and then they flip out, they get upset. Mm -hmm. Next time they ask you for feedback, you're like, oh, I'm not going there. When we train and condition people how to treat each other, right? So looking at creating that emotional safety, and that's important as leaders, because are we creating that environment, that culture about emotional safety? And there's a lot more on that, but that's a key strategy. A third technique is to reward honesty. So sometimes people feel like I can get the unsaid said, but it's a waste of time. Nothing's mm -hmm. going to change, right? I'm sure, you know, in project world, like in, in what you all um, handle, and just what I've seen as a whole, right? People will sometimes say, well, I feel safe to bring it up, but it's a waste. Nothing's going to change here, mm -hmm. you know? And so we have to reward honesty. In other words, when people speak up, we have to do something with that feedback. Even if we're going to make an entirely different decision, somebody giving us that feedback teaches us what's going on in their head. And mm -hmm. so there's a lot of things around rewarding feedback, but if they ask questions, they create emotional safety and the reward 
honesty, they reward that feedback. It's people will really start to share and get that unsaid said, which helps the whole organization improve and ultimately improve the uh, revenue and profitability and accomplish the mission and goals of the company and the organization. You know, when you're talking about fear, you know, but this does go back to the idea of, um, you know, the individual being accountable, right? And, you know, even if, if nothing does change, you know, you should still say it. Um, um, is uh, Jordan Peterson talks a lot about that, about being more afraid of what happens if you don't say something than what does. And that often we actually don't, we don't calculate the risk of silence. Um, yeah. Yep. So um, on he, on our uh, website, if they go to justbehonest.com, it's not going to cost them anything. So I'm not leading down here by this. It's not. If you go to our website, justbehonest.com, at the bottom of the website, it should be there, although we just redid it, but I still think it's there. Anyway, it's called Honesty Calculator. It's the only calculator out there that takes an issue and it calculates the cost of it not getting resolved. So to mm -hmm. your point... It is a way to specifically realize and calculate the exact cost of an issue not getting resolved and not being brought up to begin with. And so it, if they go through that, it doesn't cost any money. So they, we, we, I created it years ago because what I found it is exactly that case. People will rationalize. They don't realize how much it costs them by not speaking up and not getting it resolved emotionally, right? But it also costs us organizations revenue, profitability, but there's stress involved. There's, um, here's another interesting uh, fallout. We don't speak up in one area, so it stresses us out. So we take it out on another area. Oh, like yeah. people get upset at work and they take it out at home. Mm -hmm. People get at home are upset and they take it out at work. So there's huge costs. So I love what you're saying. And they, if they go to honesty and honesty calculator, and if they can't find it, just go to our information and say, where is it? We'll uh, direct them to it. Um, but I'm really passionate about this around this honesty calculator because it is a big issue. People don't realize how not getting the unsaid said and resolving issue is cost, not only the organization, but it costs us in our own life. Hmm. Well, um, Stephen, this has been a really fascinating conversation, but we're, we're close, quickly closing in on time. So maybe you could leave your, um, what three tips you want to leave top of mind with the audience. So one thing is I would say about being unconditionally powerful and around the whole thing around getting us, uh, you know, making the unaware aware and that whole reframing. So if you frame an issue in a different way, like enlarging the frame, as we talked about, that can really have people be much more powerful and get out of that conditional mindset. Second is around honest communication, getting that unsaid said. Right. The biggest problem is not what people say is what they don't say and getting that unsaid said. And the third is around something we didn't talk much about, but around creating high achieving teams. And I say this as a difference from high performing teams, because the word mm. performing could be confused with hard work. And it's really about achieving. Right. So this is where people say, well, you know, I, what do you want me to do? I'm working hard. And your answer was, well, that's not really the problem. It's about achievement. So right. how do you create consistently high achieving teams? whatever the case may be. But one tip around that is to change, switch out the word performing with achieving, and then talk about it's about producing the results. And switching that terminology and addressing it, and looking at that in a different frame can also produce remarkable results as it has with my clients. Hmm, that's great. Well, how can um, folks, I know you mentioned your website, maybe repeat it again, but how can they learn more about what you do or get in contact with you? Great. Thank you uh, for asking. So justbehonest.com. So um, if they go to our website, justbehonest.com, and they say they listen to this podcast, I'll send them the first book I wrote, the electronic version, but it's called, the first book I ever wrote was called Just Be Honest. And mm. we will send them that book that, so they don't have to pay for anything um, about that book. And um, we'll send it to them for free, but they've got to, they have to do two things that I request. One is of course, say they listen to it, but I also want to hear what they've done with what we've talked about. Cause I'm big on paying it forward. So they, they don't have to write long explanation. They could say it improved my family life or business or whatever, but address that they listen to the show. And second, that they say what they did as a result of it. Okay. And so just be honest.com. Excellent. And when is your book coming out again? Uh, September 12th. Excellent. So uh, it'll be out by then. And of course, if they want um, an article around unconditional power, because they like the concept and, you know, get it moving. Um, if they email us um, also through justbehonest.com, there's an info at Stephen Gavin, you know, whatever that is on the website. If they contact us um, with that, we'll send them the article on unconditional power. So to give them some immediate ideas of what they can do on this. 
Excellent. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to be a guest today, Stephen. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Mm, yeah. And to our audience, until next time, keep your organizations healthy.